Hi, good morning. I'm glad to be here in this panel on uh, user experience. Uh, our panelists today are Michael Sean from Volvo Cars um, R&D Innovation Center, uh, Mr. Ulrich Leders from Continental's Research and Portfolio User Experience, Mr. Tal uh, Krishpov from uh, um, Sipia. Sorry for that. It's an Israeli startup in uh, the field of driver and cabin monitoring, and Mr. Kirsten Heineke from um, the uh, McKinsey Center for Future Mobility. Uh, it's a real uh, pleasure to be here. Uh, the panelists are uh, basically representing uh, a variety of the industry's segments. You have an OEM, uh, Vision uh, Tier 1, Tier 2, and a strategic consultant, and myself, just a lawyer. Uh, <laughs> Um, so I actually wanted to start uh, by citing a McKinsey's article on user experience uh, by which the statement was, and I'm citing, car manufacturers once, com once competed largely on their engineering capabilities, superior driving performance, and reliability. But this became sort of commodity, although they are important, they are still commodity. And the real battleground now is the customer experience. So assuming my panelists here are in agreement with that, I would probably start by asking maybe Michael and Ulrich, um, what are the trends and what are the directions in which, uh, to which the industry is heading that really enhance this, uh, let's, uh, the, the, the user experience as a major factor, as a, a, a switch of paradigm to user experience? Uh, yes. So, well, of course, ambition, that is to provide uh, freedom to move in a personal, safe, and sustainable way. Uh, the big mega trends we are seeing is, of course, the four uh, ACEs, as you probably know. Uh, we have electrification, of course, which is an extension of the sustainability transformation. We have autonomous drive. Um, we have connectivity and additional compute and also shared mobility. In addition to these four megatrends, what we see is a big shift in the software domain as well. Uh, in the past, the T1s and T2s did much more of the software, but consumers have a different expectation these days. They expect the software to continuously uh, upgrade itself, uh, similar to a smartphone. And the same is happening now also in the automotive industry. The OEM is taking a much more uh, responsibility of the customer experience that is created by the application layer of the software. We see also more advanced in-cabin tech. Uh, we are using more AI and uh, use of data in the car, and also the connection to the entire uh, digital ecosystem. Yeah, yeah so, so maybe to the answer about uh, UX user experience, we have a saying that it's, uh, UX is the new horsepower. So um, because with electrification, the diff diversification by drivetrain is, is going away, and you see now that premium OEMs like Volvo and others are, are heavily investing in the user experience. And, and the expectation from the end user is knowing smartphones, using this one is a flawless experience in the car. What can we do or what factors are behind? We see certain factors. The one is, I think, as you said, the computing power. Uh, we have then the connectivity, which uh, you can bring new software inside. You have then the devices. Yeah? So we see more and more interaction devices, like bigger displays, head-up displays. Uh, and in the end, it sends the software behind let's say, which enables this experience. But I think the, the point is that this flawless working together of the experience is, is the user expectation, yeah. So it's user ex experience in the broad sense of the word, not, not only interface, but really the entire uh, experience, the software, the AI, the yeah. device experience. Yeah, it, it's a combination of, of the output devices or whatever device you use and the computing power, the software, the online uh, avail availability, but the experience comes with, let's say, everything working together flawless as, as you go into the car, uh, flawless working, and then you're generating some new experiences or new interaction with the car, let's call it like this. Not, not let's say, maybe the complex interaction, but a dedicated interaction situation, related interaction, for example, yeah. So what are, um, and maybe Kirsten, maybe you can uh, start with that. Uh, what are the major areas of user experience that you see the industry investing in or interested in today? 
So uh, I'm going to pick up something that was said earlier. I think electrification is obviously coming, right? So we can see the path towards 100% electric vehicles, and it's not going only to happen in 2030. It's going to happen in some countries and in some segments even earlier. And the biggest worry for many people at the moment is, in my mind, charging because you have anxiety about the range of the vehicle, the anxiety about will I find a charge point, yes or no, and then will it work, and how will the experience be? And I think there is a massive chance to actually make charging a much better experience than uh, fueling up the car at the gas station is. Because yes, it, it usually works, but you get your hands dirty, you have to get out of the car, you have to stand outside, you have to wait, you have to go inside and pay, and so on. So it's not ideal. And I think by making charging a more integrated part of the entire journey, because the vehicle knows when it needs to be charged, you can pre-book, you can do the payment just online, if you will, without having uh, you having to go inside and pay somewhere with a credit card or something, that's going to be a massive step up. And I think there are five to ten things other uh, that you can actually do to make that even better. And let me pick another thing. So we're going to spend more time probably in our cars with autonomous driving because it's going to be more convenient to be driven rather than drive yourself and you're going to have time on your hands with stuff to, to do stuff so like your morning commute where you could be working for example and the other question is how can you create a user experience in the car that will make you want to spend more time in the car and use that time profitably and then the question is who is going to monetize that time is it going to be Google, Apple, or other tech companies, or could it be the OEMs, and I think, or the suppliers? And I think that's going to be another question. From uh, the perspective of the um, in-cabin uh, experience, which is uh, where uh, CPA is focused, um, we see an interesting trend where the first effect that consumers and drivers will experience at large is on the safety experience. Uh, driver monitoring is becoming a regulatory requirement and in the safety standards as well. And that is the motivation for uh, OEMs to introduce the camera into the cabin or other sensing means. But once the sensors are there and OEMs incur this uh, regulatory penalty, if you will, um, they seek for ways to leverage it to differentiate and make an experience which is more robust whether it's personalization through face identification or um, um, investing in new interaction modalities by detecting the gaze direction and through that what is the driver intent with which area of the car uh, the driver actually wants to uh, uh, interact. Um, and that is something that we already see today. I'm sure that as we go ahead we see strong interest by OEMs in understanding not just the driver but the entire cabin and all the occupants through a cabin monitoring system who is in the vehicle, their demographics, their expressions and mood, the actions that they engage in that lead to the question that you raised, how do we monetize and serve better uh, and make services and products more accessible in the cabin during the ride? Maybe Ruby? Yeah, yeah, I think this uh, example with the camera is a good one. I think the one aspect is, okay, how you use the time, how you monetize, for example, the car. The other aspect, I think, is the experience from the driver, how he can easily operate with the car. And the camera exactly is, a, is one example where you say, okay, I'm going to change the UX content depending where the driver is looking at. And we are working on concepts or technologies like ChiTech, for example. So screens are just showing up if, if you look at it and, and if you need a certain information. I think that's a, that's a basic. And then the, the autonomous driving then maybe is a different world. Yeah? So we, we have first going from... You use the car yourself, yeah, then um, you have to explain maybe the, what the car is doing autonomously, and then once the driver gets the trust, um, then basically you talk about, okay, what to do with the time he's spending. Yeah. What about uh, the outside, um, the, outside the car and the yeah, integration between the outside and the inside? Yeah, for, for sure, and, and the charging was an example. So the user experience doesn't start in the car. It starts when you access the car. For example, there are also um, algorithms detecting that detecting you from your walking to the car already, um, opening the car, entering the car, um, or we had this like, example with charging, so I think where you could uh, also build a world around, uh, um, some OEMs are doing now like having premium charging stations, and I think that's a point that it's not only inside the car, but it's around everything when you use the car in the end, yeah. There is also an interesting uh, potential, and something that we're actively promoting, and that is to combine the sensing of the vehicle, the external sensing such as the ADAS, 
and the internal sensing of the driver to combine both systems into a holistic safety system. So the external ADA system understands the context of the driver and their state, and vice versa. The driver monitoring system understands the external context of the vehicle and can manage things like driver attention in a better way. Michael, any comment? I mean, what Ocora has always represented safety, of course. Uh, if we can kind of look out back in the mirror, I mean, it started with mechanical safety. Uh, what happened a few decades was uh, active safety, and that is when you include um, sensors uh, and also actuators to avoid or, or mitigate uh, an accident. Uh, the third level happening now, that is to use the uh, driver monitoring systems to uh, monitor the cognitive state of the, of the driver, uh, of course, in a GDPR uh, compliant way, of course. Uh, but most reasons for accidents today is related to intoxication, drowsiness or, or distraction. So if we can create a seamless uh, system that can support the driver to address these issues, we can improve safety even further. Yeah. You, you also uh, told me about uh, your, um, uh, y that you know, noticing uh, the sustainability requirement uh, or the sustainability purpose. Yes. Um, the biggest drivers now in, the, in this industry, actually, it is two, I think, if we should really simplify it. It's the sustainability moment, uh, which electrification is essentially a consequence out of that. Um, the second is also technology. Uh, technology or new technology is disrupting uh, the industry. Uh, we see that also here a lot here in Israel, of course, with a lot of new high-tech innovation. Uh, both when it comes to compute, but also when it comes to uh, sensor technology. Mm -hmm. What are the challenges from a technological point of view uh, for enabling all this? I mean, uh, maybe, uh, Michael, if you want to treat it, or, or Ulrich. What are, mm -hmm. Because in order to, com all, all the connectivity, all the communication, all these sensors, all these software, they need to rely on something, all the content. Yeah, I mean, there, there's a big shift now in the electrical architecture in the automotive industry. Uh, in the past, it was more distributed. Uh, the trend is to go to more centralized compute. There will still be a lot of ease use, of course, but if you should be able to do sensor fusion and AI, you need to have a kind of common data repository that you can work on. Uh, otherwise, it will not work. Yeah, exactly. That's the trend, the backbone of all of this to, to have this flawless experience, I think, is a high-performance computer. You have to ex enough computing power, which is one or three or whatever devices. I think that's the point. And, um, but the key is now you have the, the data yeah, and, and you have to manage the software, so which is quite complex if you now integrate tons of functions onto, onto one computer. But that's exactly the point where you have to to bring topics together and oh, where we also see this cooperation here yeah, that we say, okay, if there is an um, in-cabin software from CPR, we bring it on the, on the, uh, on the high-performance computer. In the end, um, it's OEM uh, providing the car to the user, defining what, what experience uh, should be on there. Yeah? Yeah. I mean, the big challenge from a user experience point of view, that is, given this amount of data, sensors and compute, you need to keep it as simple as possible so it doesn't become a distraction. The trend we also see in the in-cabin tech, that is, of course, uh, new kinds of sensors, uh, like radar-based or, or optical sensors. Um, but uh, you, you need to kind of create actionable data uh, or actionable information out of the data, because the raw data is not uh, adding value. You need to create uh, these uh, yeah, value-created uh, applications on top of that. There's also a challenge with the agile, agile nature of software. Most of the new experiences are uh, enabled by software, ultimately, and software rapidly evolves, new releases constantly. But on the other hand, the automotive world is uh, used to very strict standards when it comes to safety or validation. Um, so the cycles uh, tend to be longer. On the other hand, consumers expect, thanks to the experience through mobile phones, the rapid updates and seeing more and more features, and especially with the new entrants such as Tesla, that push new UI, just like on the mobile phone, into the vehicle. And uh, I think that uh, we still need to work together to find the right rhythm 
uh, and cadence to ensure that this uh, rapid deployment can happen uh, in all vehicles without, of course, jeopardizing the um, strict uh, quality standards. And I think you touched a great point there. So in my mind, it's not only going to be about technology and making sure we can update the vehicles. It's also a question about the mindset of the automotive industry. And the Tesla example is a great one. I think Tesla is a very user-centric company, whereas probably, and I'm going to say this politely, the rest of the automotive industry isn't necessarily. So I think starting to think from the customer and from the customer experience first, because you said customer experience is the new, horse, uh, the new horsepower, that's going to be a huge mindset shift. And I think it may have started in some cases, but we're not where we need to be for the auto industry, in my mind. Yeah, I think that, that's a point. The fun, it, it hasn't been to function just to define function. Yeah, It has to be used for the customer, and it has to be uh, in use in that situation. That's a point. Yeah? So I think there are tons of function today inside the vehicle, which um, a lot of customers may never use. Yeah, But uh, I think this intuitive and experience, uh, the customer wants to do something, and then the right function is on demand there, and it's a flawless experience. That's, that's the key. Yeah? And I think you're right. Tesla is coming from the software development. Fine vehicle, that's being a vehicle company. Yeah. Yeah, if, if we look on another important trend as well, uh, related to smart mobility and user experience, what we see now is a big urbanization of the cities. There's a lot of people moving in. I mean, um, you have all been driving here on the streets in Tel Aviv and see the, the traffic situation. It's a challenge. It's also a challenge in many other large cities in the world. Cities are going to be even more crowded. So many OEMs now, they are um, starting to go to become more mobility providers, not just selling vehicles, but uh, solutions to provide freedom to move. So here we see a new, new business models coming up as well, uh, which is creating another user experience. I mean, this is from a kind of a, a different kind of a, uh, angle. Yeah, Kirsten, uh, uh, can you tell us a bit about your uh, vision of, of, you know, beyond the car? The shared, what, what Michael just mentioned. Happy to. So it goes exactly in, the, in that direction. I think even if we have more people moving into cities and even if we have people getting wealthier to a certain extent, we cannot afford to keep adding cars to cities with the same ratio how we've been adding cars to cities with more people moving in and with people getting richer. What we need to do instead, in my mind, is we need to start thinking about a city that has much fewer cars, where the cars are being shared, and where you have alternative ways of getting from A to B. So I'm um, doing work with a couple of cities and so on, and I found one ambition very clear. One city told me that they want to get rid of 90, 90 percent of all the vehicles in the city by 2030. I love that ambition, because honestly, if we are honest to ourselves, how many trips are we doing where we're basically taking a car, a two-ton car, maybe even a heavier car, for a two-kilometer, three-kilometer journey where it's just us in the car. That's not necessary. It's actually a waste of resources. It's a waste of space and many other things. On a positive note, I think mobility ultimately will always include the car, and we'll need to create an experience where when we go somewhere, an app or an algorithm somewhere tells us what is the best vehicle, what is the best option for that time of day, for the weather condition, for what we have with us, if it's another passenger, if we want to go grocery shopping, obviously maybe the e-kick scooter isn't the best thing, but maybe a cargo bike is. And I think this integrated experience where we might ultimately also be paying for mobility by a flat rate of a couple of hundred euros, dollars, whatever a month, uh, and then you have a car, you have access to a car, but you also have something else, and that something else might be 20%, maybe even 80% of your usage. That, in my mind, is going to be the future, and obviously experience is going to play a massive role there. That, um, will this, you, you, we're talking about a real shift in paradigm of the entire uh, mobility world. Uh, do you think it will affect the relationship between you know, between OEM, tier ones, tier twos, now th with the Google and Apples uh, coming into play. Um, do you, how do you see that? Um, uh, well, of course, I've introduced uh, the Google uh, Android automotive syst operating system in uh, XC40 and also in the C40 model, and it's coming also in, in um, uh, future models as well. So this is being rolled out. Um, 
we are working together with the T1s and T2s. I mean, to solve all these challenges we have ahead of us, we need to collaborate, of course, uh, in, in a win-win scenario, of course. So that's a no-brainer. What we see also in the user experience point of view, that is two levels. You need an enabling technology, but you also need to have value-creating technology. And then you need to fill it with content. Uh, talking about content, and in particular infotainment content, this is not part of Volvo Car's business model to produce infotainment content. But we partner up with uh, other companies. Um, the GAS, um, the Google uh, application services, uh, we have interface with Google uh, Maps, uh, Google Assistant, etc. This is open up to a new kind of digital ecosystem. Um, so I think everyone is benefiting from that. Yeah. yeah, I would say that for sure, um, I think OEM, tier one, tier two is working together um, regarding the big tech companies. Um, it's still undecided, I would say. Yeah, they, they, I would say their aim is to go, to go into the car. They see it on an IoT a device on, on wheels, yeah, where, let's say, OEMs are positioning differentiate. Yeah, they, they say, either I do it myself, keep them out. Um, some of them are working together, so it's still undecided, I would say. Yeah? And, and uh, for sure, it's a challenge, because if you talk about the mobility experience, yeah, um, a lot of people, people use Google Maps on the iPhone, yeah, right. and then um, the starting point is there. Yeah? So that, that will be a challenge for the, for the whole industry. Yeah? And, and who is then, in the end, it's a mobility platform, if I say I want to go A to B, and, and who is then the right entry point or the owner of this one? Yeah? And I believe that there is a, a challenge here, because um, even in this shift, um, obviously we will need to maintain for the users, for the consumers, still the perception of the personal nature of mobility. The reason everybody holds today a vehicle, even if they don't utilize it 96% utilize it of the time, is because they have the freedom, freedom to utilize it whenever they want, and when they use it, it's their own. So um, in these shared services, we will need to have a high level of personalization, and part of the key to that will be the data. And there we will have the outright fight or war over data ownership. Who has access to this data? Um, right. Is it the OEM? Is it the uh, service enablers? Is it the platforms? Uh, is it the uh, external providers like Google and Apple? Thanks. Kirsten, do you want to say something about that? Or? Oh, always happy to. I think, so I, I like, I think it's, it's still very much undecided. We always talk about something called horizontalization of the industry. So at the moment you have the OEMs and you have the tier ones that basically work together and the OEMs are ultimately deciding what's in the car and the OEMs are also ultimately making, at least at the moment, a ton of money off of that, right? I think what we're going to see is dominating players that take some horizontal layers of the vehicle stack, like the uh, operating system, like the autonomous driving stack, maybe even some chips and so on. And these players are going to become increasingly relevant. And some of these players we talked about, I think there's a couple of others, uh, but I'm with you, it's still undecided. Let me say how many vertical players will survive and how many horizontal players will be coming up, making a ton of money and extracting a ton of value. Michael, I think uh, with you we'll yeah. finalize. I mean, we started with the user experience from the in-cabin and then we moved uh, outside the, the, the car quite a lot. Um, every year, roughly 80 million cars are produced. Uh, the majority of those are now connected uh, to the cloud. Um, and of course, this is creating a completely new um, uh, business. You see cities putting requirement how to manage traffic. Uh, we see how the vehicle to X uh, infrastructure is, is ramping up. So um, many of these traffic problems we have today will probably be mitigated by this new kind of uh, enabling technology that will support a better uh, city brain and traffic management system as well. So ultimately, this would create a better user experience. OK, thank you. Uh, maybe we have one minute for questions from the audience if someone wants to ask something. OK, so thank you very much. Ah, sorry. Go ahead. He's asking about air taxis. Um, so I think air taxis are going to become a reality for sure. It's a bit of a question of timeline. Um, five years ago, if you had asked me air taxis or autonomous first, I would have said autonomous first. I think now probably air taxis stand a good chance of being at the same time. 
uh, it's going to be a relevant share of mobility, but think of it more like taxis and high-end taxis, at least for now, uh, rather than taking away private cars and completely changing the way how we go from A to B. But I definitely, I'm a strong believer in air taxis, and I think it's going to be a great, a great technology that makes our lives easier. So on so Monday, the air would be filled with taxis. I don't think so. But I think <laughs> on Monday, I would have loved it because it took me an hour to get from the airport to my hotel. Air taxi would have been 15 minutes max. Would have loved it. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's a challenging and exciting world, isn't it? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.